Jesus, when he was asked about what is the greatest commandment, he said to love God and to love your neighbor as yourself. Um, these two things sum everything else up. And I've been thinking about that a lot, and I don't think it's because Jesus was saying, you know, if you don't do these two things, it's going to really irritate God. Um, Jesus came that we might have life. And so if you want to have life, the best ways you can do it is to love God and love your neighbor. Now, we live in a, in a world with a lot of neighbors, with a lot of people, and we're going to have to relate with them. And one of the things I love about the Bible is when it paints a picture of somebody, um, it really just is honest. It's truthful. Um, when, when God makes a portrait of a family, it, it doesn't look like this. Uh, so there's uh, Christina and I on our wedding day. You're so cute. With my dad and my mom. So my dad and mom weren't together at that point. My mom had just taken a nasty fall and had a big black eye that she somehow covered up with makeup. You wouldn't know that by looking at that picture. Um, Christina's parents weren't together and uh, I don't think we get along with them all that well. But if you look at that picture, you wouldn't think that. You're like, oh, that's nice. But you really have no clue what's going on with the story. The Bible is not like that. When the Bible paints a family portrait, it looks more like uh, this one. Yes. <laughs> Shows the mistakes and the flaws, the times when people get hurt, and how God brings people back and restores them. I hope that little... Brahma, it didn't have too much damage. It is sand, so that's good. <laughs> uh, this series is looking at families, but it's not just about families. Um, it's about coworkers and friends and neighbors and who are we called to be and how does the way that we connect with them change our lives. Um, and the reality is, I think how we connect with others, um, more than money, more than stuff, more than career success, will define whether or not we have an abundant life or whether or not we have a miserable life. Um, it, will, it will absolutely change that. So the first um, story we're going to go to is the absolute first family that we see in Scripture, the original, and it is Adam and Eve. I think I put a picture in them so that you can look at something <laughs> besides me. There they are in oh. all their renaissance, I don't know, uh, masterpiecing. We can't see them. Oh, you can't see me. <laughs> Because the art's nice, Dave. Go. Yeah, it's really nice. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, so in this story, uh, there's there's really two chapters for Adam and Eve's story. There's Genesis two and Genesis three. In Genesis two, they're brought together. In Genesis three, they're torn apart. And I'm going to take them a little bit backwards, and I'm doing it for a reason. But uh, I'm going to read for us Genesis three. This is what is commonly known as the fall. It is the time that. Dysfunction entered into the world, where sin entered into the world, and separation began between people. And I think there's some things we can learn about what gets in our way when we're trying to connect with others through this. So I'll, I'll read the um, first 13 verses. So God had set them up in paradise. They were working the for they were working this garden, and it was abundant and lush, and um, the work wasn't so bad. And, and here's what you get. Now the serpent was more crafty than all the other wild animals that the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, Did God really say you must not eat from that tree, from any tree in this garden? The woman said to the serpent, We may eat fruit from the trees in the garden, but God did say you must not eat fruit from the tree that's in the middle of the garden, and you must not touch it, or you will die. You will certainly not die, the serpent said to the woman, for God knows that when you eat from it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God. You will know good and evil for yourself. And when the woman saw that the fruit of the tree was good for food and pleasing to the eye and also desirable for gaining wisdom, she took some and she ate it. She also gave some to her husband who was with her and he ate it. And then the eyes of both of them were opened and they realized they were naked. So they sewed fig leaves together and made coverings for themselves. And then the man and his wife heard the sound of the Lord God as he was walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And they hid from the Lord God among the trees of the garden. But the Lord God called to the man, Where are you? As if he didn't know. And he answered, I heard you in the garden and I was afraid because I was naked. So I hid. And he said, Who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten from the tree that I commanded you not to eat from? And the man said, the woman you put me here with. Well, she's the one who gave me the fruit of the tree, and I ate it. 
And then the Lord God said to the woman, What is this thing you have done? And the woman said, Well, the serpent deceived me, and so I ate it. And we'll pause there. Um, there are three elements of this story that, that lead to breakdown in relationship with God and with other people. And the first was the temptation. Eat this fruit, and you'll be able to judge everything for yourself. It was the lie that we can be independent. We don't actually need God to help us. There's no need for that. Um, we live in a culture that tells us if we don't have it all together ourselves, that something must be wrong. And that is a lie from the pit of hell, in my opinion. We are actually made to be dependent. Dependent on God, and dependent on each other. Um, we can't live full lives without God and others. That's why we're commanded to love the Lord our God with all of our heart and to love each other. It's not just to make the world a better place, it's because we're made for that. And when we don't live according to that, when we don't connect with each other, rely on each other, and rely on the Lord, we will have less and less life, and our world will shrink, and it will be just it's not how God designed us. The second thing, you all already laughed at, so you picked it up. The blame. Um, blame is an is a interesting deal, and there is a, a, a remarkably good speaker, but more than that, she's a, um, a researcher and a professor. She spent the last 16 years studying um, vulnerability, empathy, um, courage, and what it means to be in relationship with each other. And um, so she's, she's somebody who has a lot of data, and she's looked at how things work. God is the one who made things work. So I want to um, share her insights a little bit on blame with you. How many of you are blamers? How many of you, when something goes wrong, the first thing you want to know is whose fault it is? Hi, my name is Brene. I am a blamer. <laughs> Let me just tell you this quick story. So this is a couple years ago when I first realized the magnitude to which I blame. I'm in my house. I have on white slacks and a pink sweater set, and I'm drinking a cup of coffee in my kitchen. It's a full cup of coffee. I drop it on the tile floor. It goes into a million pieces, splashes up all over me. And the first, I mean, a millisecond after it hit the floor, right out of my mouth is this. Damn you, Steve. <laughs> Who's my husband? Because let me tell you how fast this works for me. So Steve plays water polo with a group of friends. And the night before, he went to go play water polo. And I said, hey, make sure you come back at 10, because you know, I can never fall asleep into your home. And he got back like at 1030. And so I went to bed a little bit later than I thought. Ergo, my second cup of coffee that I probably would not be having had he come home when we discussed. Therefore, and so the rest of that story is I'm cleaning up um, the kitchen. Steve calls, caller ID. I'm like, hey. He's like, hey, what's going on, babe? <laughs> what's going on? Um, <laughs> So I'll tell you exactly what's going on. <laughs> I'm cleaning up the coffee that spilled all, dude, like dial tone. Because <laughs> he knows. How many of you go to that place when something bad happens, the first thing you want to know is whose fault is it? I'd rather it be my fault than no one's fault. Because why? Why? Because it gives us some semblance of control. But here, if you enjoy blaming... This is where you should stick your fingers in your ear and do the na 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 thing because I'm getting ready to ruin it for you. Because here's what we know from the research. Blame is simply the discharging of discomfort and pain. It has an inverse relationship with accountability. Accountability, by definition, is a vulnerable process. It means me calling you and saying, hey, my feelings were really hurt about this and talking. It's not blaming. Blaming is simply a way that we discharge anger. People who blame a lot seldom have the tenacity and grit to actually hold people accountable because we expend all of our energy raging for 15 seconds and figuring out whose fault something is. And blaming is very corrosive in relationships, and it's one of the reasons we miss our opportunities for empathy. 
because when something happens and we're hearing a story, we're not really listening. We're in the place where I was making the connections as quickly as we can about whose fault something was. Now to add a God element to that, um, she talked about how, how blame is a, is a kind of a stiff arming of each other. It, it's sitting there and saying, I'm going to make space between us because it's your fault or somebody else's fault that I didn't get my way. Discomfort and pain. That's what we get when we don't get our way. Um, the beauty about being in a relationship with God is there is a new way. There's God's way, which is the goal for all of us. Um, and then people can come together and say, what is God's best in this situation? We can disagree about it, we can talk about it, but it gets us through this idea of it must be somebody else's fault. Um, I had a really cool conversation this week, and we talked about a little bit about um, how we view ourselves in the world. Um, it was actually me and Jordan. Hey, thanks for being here, Jordan. It's a good conversation. And, uh, um, and the idea that came out of it was uh, we kind of see ourselves as managers or directors of a movie in which we're the star and everybody else plays a supporting role. <laughs> and therefore, everybody else's job is to do what they're supposed to be doing in order for me to be the most comfortable and the most happy. Um, that's what happens when we're in charge. And then it leads really quickly into this idea of it's their fault that something bad is happening. And when we put God at the center of it, there's this God who brings us back and restores us when we let him be at the center. And um, part of that is also going before each other and saying, I'm going to own my part of the brokenness. I have no requirement on somebody else owning their part. I can't control that. But for what it's worth, for my side of it, here's where I fell short. And then the connection comes back. That corrosive stuff in the relationship that made the relationship crinkle down goes away. It's the opposite of blaming. Part of what happened in the garden was we got divided from each other. I can imagine Eve's look when Adam said, well, she made me do it. No, you, you kind of took the apple and then you ate it and you knew which apple it was. Uh, and then she's blaming the serpent. The last thing that happens in that story that I want to bring to light is... Um, there's hiding. God's wandering in the garden looking for Adam. It's not like he didn't know where he was. Uh, it wasn't a mystery to God. God is leaving an opportunity for Adam to present himself. And then he asks a question, did, did you eat that apple? And it's another opportunity for Adam to go, here's my side of the story I, 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 I did. How can I set this right? But that's not what we get. Um, there is a fear in all of us. Uh, I read a great book called The Silence of Adam. There's this fear in all of us uh, where we want to hide and we want to make clothes and we want to cover up so that nobody can see really who we are. And if we are never vulnerable, we're never fully present with each other. Uh, I like to manage other people's perspective of me. I want everyone to see me as uh, having it all together, looking really good and doing everything I do really, really well. Any of you who have known me for more than like 10 minutes know that that is absolutely not true. But I still present that because I have this fear of rejection. I have a fear that you guys will disapprove of it and that that'll hurt. Um, but I can't actually connect with you until I'm vulnerable and I'm fully there. Until you get to see who I am and then decide to accept me or not. It's a risky adventure. It takes tremendous courage to do that, to be there and not hide from one another. But until we do it, um, there's going to be space. And there's consequences as a result of not just Adam and Eve's choice, but our choices to hide and to um, blame and to um, have independence from one another. And um, let me read them for you. It's verses 16 through 19. I'm going to read what part of the the outflow, cause and effect that happens as a result of this. So, um, verses 16 through 19. 
To the woman he said, I will make pains in your childbearing, very severe. With painful labor you will give birth to children. Sorry, Alyssa. <laughs> uh, your desire will be for your husband and he will rule over you. And to Adam he said, because you listened to your wife and you ate the fruit from the tree which I commanded you, you must not eat from it. Cursed is the ground because of you. Through painful toil you will eat from it all the days of your life. It will produce thorns and thistles for you. You will eat the plants of the field. By the sweat of your brow you will eat your food and you return to the ground since from it you were taken. For dust you are and to dust you will return. It's a very interesting comment in there. You'll desire each other. Because I think it applies to both sides, but it's not just the woman's going to desire the man. There's there's mutual desire for each other, but here's what's going to happen as you desire one another. You will rule over one another. A power dynamic comes into play. When we try to get our way, we want to exert our power so that the other person doesn't exert theirs and we get what we want. Suddenly, instead of being on the same team working together in the Garden of Paradise, you get power dynamics in one person putting another person down. Now, the second thing that's going to happen is when you try to be productive, it's not going to work very well. Um, I am a person who likes to do everything myself. It's, it's an incredible challenge for me at church. And you'll see that like I'm the guy pushing the button on the projector right now. Not because none of you know how to push a button on a projector, but I stink at asking for help with it. It's like... Something that I'm seriously trying to grow in. But part of that is I want to be independent. I want control. Um, and yet, life abundant is found in this place where we're asking for one another's help and inviting contributions. Um, and then pain, relational pain. Um, not just pain in childbirth, but uh, when we start to get disconnected from each other, that's where the pain comes in. Um, now, if we look at what the story of heaven is, what is heaven going to be like? All the nations are gathered together. There's still work being done because I'm still planning on eating when I'm in heaven and I'm betting the food's going to be really good. But who's making that food? Well, Chuck's making turkey. I know that. Um, there's still work to be done, but we're doing it together. We're using our power and our strength not to get our way, but instead to lift up other people, to encourage them, to uh, empower them, to uplift them and to bring about God's will. Like when we're all doing that together, anytime you've been on like a little mission trip or maybe you've gone and served at a food bank or whatever, and everybody's kind of of the same accord and they're all doing their different parts together, it's a lot of fun, isn't it? It's a blast to serve some folks. Um, that's that taste of abundant life that heaven's going to be like. Work will be fulfilling. And we'll be dependent on God and others. But that feels like it's hard to be dependent on somebody, but it's actually a celebration when it happens. When you can fully show up and go, you know what, other people are there for me and I'm there for them. That's a celebration. It's a beautiful thing. And that's what we're headed towards with God. All right. That was hard stuff, man. That was the dark side of it. That's why I wanted to save the why they got brought together. Now for some good news. Um, chapter two is why Adam and Eve were together. So we're going to take a look at a couple verses from there, starting in verse 20. Here's what it says. So the man had given names to all the livestock, the birds in the sky, and all the wild animals. But for Adam, no suitable helper was found. So the Lord God caused the man to fall into a deep sleep. And while he was sleeping, he took one of the man's ribs, closed up the place with flesh. Then the Lord God made a woman from the rib. He had taken out of the man, and he brought her to the man. And the man said, This is now bone of my bones, flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman, for she was taken out of man. And that is why a man would leave his father and mother and be united with his wife, and they become one flesh. Adam and his wife were both naked. They felt no shame. Um, if the fall came from independence, right? I don't need God to tell me right or wrong. Um, I can do my thing. This is the exact opposite. It, it was dependence. Um, 
Adam saw all the animals and there wasn't the right suitable helpmate. That's somebody who comes alongside. It's not a, it's not a diminutive term uh, when you look at the Hebrew. It's not a, oh, he needed a, a, a little helper. Uh, it's not that. It, it, it's, it's a partner to do what he was doing. They were brought into relationship because it was needed. Um, actually, if you look at the Trinity, God the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, it's very interesting. God himself is a community. God, the perfect being, the one who was before and will always be there, the, the, the perfect blueprint of what could be is a community needing one another and working together to bring about restoration to the world. That's a great image. That's who we are and we're made in his image. So dependence upon one another, complementary yet different, and our lives, our lives get richer when we have people not like us around us, which is a tricky thing. I've done a lot of work with small groups in my ministry time. And one of the easiest ways to put together a small group is for me to find like 20 people who have everything in common and say, go hang out with each other. Right. I have found a group uh, for 20 somethings who all have had kids in the last three months and we're all the same. And it is so easy to bond with people who are just like you. You're like, sweet, we're all in the same boat. This is great. But you know what doesn't happen? Your lives don't actually get richer. Because all you do is vent about the same stuff to each other. Another thing happens when we enter this space where we are with people who are different than us. See the world differently. Disagree with us on some stuff. Uh, and yet we go, man, I need to be in partnership with you. And then what happens is we begin to glean some things from them that we might not have seen otherwise. The most rich and rewarding small groups are the hardest ones to form because it involves people who are not like us. One of the things I love about Harbor Church is it's not big enough for me to just find people just like me. We're kind of stuck with each other and we're a, a beautifully dysfunctional group that God seems to want to work with. And we have tons of stuff to learn from one another. And so that's why we stay in relationship. Um, that's why we shoot for it. The last thing that it said about them was they were naked, but they knew no shame. Um, they were vulnerable and honest. They showed up. They said who they were. They acted how they did, and they didn't worry about fear of rejection or somebody devaluing them. And that is one of the greatest gifts we can give to the world. For us to show up and to say, here I am. I'm not going to hold back. I'm not going to manage my image of you. I'm going to show you who I am and be honest. Because in the midst of doing that, connection gets formed and then we can give to one another. Um, but it is impossible to do that if we hold a bunch of stuff back. So bring ourselves, don't let the fear stop us from being present with each other and with God. There is grace um, in this story, by the way. It's the fall. It's, it's, it's the breaking of relationship with God. And yet, I want to look at how God responds. I'm going to put a verse up. Uh, verse 21. One of the responses as Adam and Eve are leaving the garden that they can no longer stay in because for them to live forever... Um, in a broken state would cause havoc. The Lord God made garments of skin for Adam and his wife, and he clothed them. As they're leaving, God says, you know what? I'm not going to leave you naked and vulnerable to the world. I'm going to go and protect you. What's clothing do? Keeps us warm and protects us. I'm glad I'm wearing shoes. Maybe not in here, but when I'm walking around in the street and stuff, when the hurts come, there's something there to bring comfort. Um, God did not abandon us because we abandoned him. Instead, he says, I'm going to clothe you. I'm going to protect you. I'm going to walk with you and care for you. I will not leave you or forsake you even to the very end of the age is what Jesus says. And then he also gave them a promise. Verse 15, put that one up. And I will put enmity between you. This is speaking to the snake. Uh, I will put enmity between you and the woman, and between your offspring and hers. He will crush your head, 
and you're going to strike his heel. There's going to be a battle between the tempter, the one who invites us to sin, and God. And here's how it's going to go down. Somebody's going to become a human being. God became a human being, became offspring. Showed us how to live. Now that was an incredible gift. To see how God lives, that's awesome. That's like setting us a pattern for how we could go about life. But had God simply done that, it's not enough. Because we can't live up to it. We can try. We can try to be right on track with Jesus. We can try to be as good as Jesus. And it's, it, we, we fail at it every time. And so we get this promise that the offspring will, will crush the head of sin going to stomp on the snake, but in the process is going to get bit. And Jesus didn't just live a great pattern for us. He then died on a cross, taking the full weight of sin and death upon him so that we could live. And in the process, crushed its power over us. And if we put our trust in him, if we, we give our lives to him, he says, that's not going to hold you anymore, just like it couldn't hold me. And so it's fitting. Restoration, that's what it's about. We get separated from God, we get separated from each other. And then Jesus, through the perfect sacrifice, brings us back to God and back to each other.